I encourage that. I participate in that. We love that man of God, and we love to see him worship. We're now on the air. Let's make welcome everybody around the world that's joining the Emmaus broadcast today. Thank you for that good singing, the worship, and to hear the man of God testify and enjoy the Lord will always be a welcome sight and encouraged sight in this church. We love that. We participate in that. He's worthy of all of our praise is what the Bible says. I said to you on the forefront that I'm dealing with a controversial subject today. I'll be honest with you, this subject has brought me much criticism down through the years. But I promised the Lord 41 years ago when I started preaching that I would never let the applause or the favor of man dictate what I preach from this Bible. I want to be faithful to God. So I need your undivided attention as we are going to read one short verse. Proverbs chapter number 20 and verse number 20, please. Whoso curseth his father or his mother, his lamp shall be put out. Now notice where it will be put out at. In obscure darkness. I want to preach this morning on the subject of the danger of entering obscure darkness. There are 30 verses in Proverbs chapter number 22, excuse me, chapter 20. When you read the 30 verses, it deals with three basic topics, wisdom, weights, and wickedness. I don't think we understand how powerful this word obscure darkness really is. It means not yet to be discovered. It means a veil of absolute blackness. It means to be blocked out forever. It means to be overshadowed by a thick blanket of blackness. The wording found in Proverbs chapter 20 and verse number 20 is so fretful, it is so powerful, that it is the only time it is ever used in all 66 books of the Bible. Obscure darkness. There is a difference, ladies and gentlemen, between human depravity and obscure darkness. The difference is simply this. One can be in the darkness of depravity and lost, but the light and the hope of the glorious gospel can be shed abroad in their heart and give them an opportunity to come to faith and repentance. Obscure darkness is a spiritual conclusion that once it has been reached, it cannot be reversed, nor could it ever be changed. There's a difference I want to say to you between obscure darkness and outer darkness. Obscure darkness is a, con a spiritual condition that is experienced during one's lifetime. And it's only found once in the Bible. Outer darkness is something that humanity will experience after their life has ended and they have died. And the terminology outer darkness is so powerful, it too has only been used three times in the Bible. With all the various lifestyles, issues, shortcomings, personalities, and characters found within the 66 books of the Bible, there are only three categories of people that are revealed as those that have developed such a dark and final spiritual state. Let's make no mistake. This dreadful condition is an eternal ending that has no possibility of ever being altered. Charles Hatton Spurgeon said this about obscure darkness. No, no, no judgment of God is so severe, yet so just, as for God to leave man in darkness. I'm aware that this message will only affect those that have not entered the veil of eternal doom. If as a result of this message you're not convicted or being drawn by God, then sad to say, I have nothing else to offer you at this point in time in life. 
So allow me this morning to let the scripture speak ever so boldly and clear as we tackle the reality of what God calls obscure darkness. In my feeble attempt, I will now mention to you the three categories of people that God pronounced this judgment upon. I'm sure that some of these, if not all of these, are going to shock you. But please hear the scripture out. Number one, God has turned people over to obscure darkness when their actions are that of reprobates. You will find this determination in Romans chapter number one. It is in verse number 21 that God says that their foolish minds were darkened. It's in verse number 28 where the Bible says that God gave them over to a reprobate mind. In Romans chapter number one, there are three categories of people that God issued a reprobate mind upon their life and their lifestyle. In verse number 22, those that have the wisdom of the world. The Bible said professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. The Bible said a fool has said in his heart there is no God. And God pronounces eternal darkness upon men that claim to be wise and deny God. We call it humanism, socialism, communism in our day. Paul warned us that knowledge puffeth up and men have got their degrees and shied away from Bible truth and embraced worldly humanism to defend their creation and their destination while leaving God out of it all alone. If you don't believe it, go to your secular universities. It is amazing what's being pumped into the minds of our children fresh out of high school. All the humanism, the anti-God movements, the atheism that's on every hand. Professors snigger down their shirt sleeves when somebody dares to say they're a professing Christian or a born-again believer. But you remember one thing if you don't remember anything else today. I'd rather be so dumb that I can't read my name in boxcar letters and know my name's recorded in heaven than to be an educated fool and die without God and go to hell in my intellect. And God pronounced obscure darkness upon the wisdom of the world. In verse 25, God pronounced this darkness of Romans chapter 1 on those that worship the creation. The Bible said this, they loved and worshiped the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever, amen. So God does not only curse humanism, he curses what I call environmentalism. Now, I don't throw garbage on the streets. I keep my grass cut. I try to do what's right as far as being clean and keeping America clean. But I do not worship Mother Earth. I am not going to bow down, bless God, to a hoot owl or a pine tree or a woodpecker. Amen. Matter of fact, every year on Earth Day, I burn two truck tires and set off three cans of Freon just to let them know I'm still celebrating Earth Day. And this same crowd that's hugging on hoot owls and kissing red-crested woodpeckers and trying to save the whales and worried about a snail is the same crowd that'll walk in an abortion clinic and slaughter a baby out of their mama and think nothing of it and then try... Now you might as well get with me because I'm going to preach it whether you like it or not. And I'm telling you, I am not worshiping this earth. God's going to burn this thing to ashes one of these days. I'm not hugging a tree, bless God Almighty. And I'm not going to turn into a vegetarian either, by the way. The Bible said the prodigal son, when he came home, the father killed the calf, not the cauliflower. And some of you need to read that in your Bible. 
Bless God, you're skinny as a rail, shriveled up like a prune, hadn't smiled in 40 years. Why don't you stop by McDonald's and eat about three Big Macs and find out what life's really all about anyhow? And God pronounced darkness on those that have worldly wisdom, those that worship the creation more than the creator. And then in verse 26 and 27, God pronounced obscure darkness on the wickedness of vile affections. It's here in these verses that has become very controversial across our country like never before. God said that men and women were doing things that was against nature. You shouldn't even have to have the Bible to teach you that a man is supposed to be with a woman and a woman is supposed to be with a man. Now, I'm just going to say it again now, and I know we're on television, and I know we're on radio, and I know we're on YouTube, and I know we're on Roku, and I know we're on church app, but I'm not changing what this Bible says uh, uh, just to stay on some, chase, some station somewhere. God said nature teaches you that God made man for the woman and woman for the man. That's how God instituted life. That's how God instituted marriage, and he's never changed his mind. And I don't care if it's a pimp or somebody running for president. This has always been an abomination to God, and it always shall be an abomination to God. And people that live like this, God will give them a reprobate mind. Prior to God bringing darkness over their conscience, there has been a time of dealing and en an enlightenment that God has given these people. But they have rejected and scoffed and ignored it. And now they have been put into obscure darkness. Here's how I know when somebody has crossed that line into obscure darkness. They become bold with their perversion. See, if even nature teaches you that this stuff is wrong, that means if you do it, you have a tendency to want to do it privately. You have a tendency to want to be secretly about it. You have a tendency not to go public with it. But once God enlightens you that it's sinful and it's wrong and you need to repent, and you grit your teeth and reject God and ignore God and say, I don't care what the Bible says, I'm going to do what feels good and what I want to do. Then God turns you over to an absolute darkness, never to deal with you, never to bother you, and never to convict you again. And when that takes place in an individual's life, they're no longer secretive. Now they're out in the street waving their rainbow flags, and they're bold as a lion, and men are kissing men, and women are kissing women. Oh, by the way, you used to shout when I preached on this till you found out your cousin was a queer. Now you don't want me preaching on it anymore. I got news, Jack. I was preaching like this before you come. I'll be preaching like this long after you're gone. It's wrong whether it's your mother, your brother, your cousin, your grandparent. I'm telling you what God said. Perversion is sin. It's wrong. And God will put them in obscure darkness. Those that have the actions of reprobates. Number two, and this is where it kind of funnels down getting closer to us. God also puts them in obscure darkness that has affiliation with religion. See, we clap when we talk about perverts and sodomites and perversion. We clap on that. But when you start talking about church people having that same obscure darkness placed upon them, all of a sudden people pull back on that. Because Jesus said in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 24, you are blind. He was talking to the Pharisees. Several times in that chapter, Jesus told them that they were in darkness. He pronounced eight woes upon them in Matthew chapter number 23. These are not reprobates. These are not men kissing men. These are not humanists denying the Bible. These are not environments that are hugging trees. These are people carrying Bibles and setting in churches. And Jesus was dealing with them because they were trusting their religion to get them to heaven when they died. Now let me show you some signs about somebody that's religious but has never really become a born-again child of God. You say, well, I go to church. Well, that makes me a Christian, really. Does that mean spending the night in the garage makes you an automobile? <laughs> you have to be born again is what the Bible said. Not denominationalism. I'm talking about trust in Jesus Christ. 
And in Matthew chapter 23, Jesus shows us signs of people that have religion, but they don't have the new birth. The first thing he said about him in verse 27, he said, you're like a whited sepulcher. You're pure, clean, and white on the outside, but inside you're filled with dead men's bones. Over in Israel every year they would take lime, and white lime, they would overdo the sepulchers of their loved ones, and they kept them spotless, and they kept them pure, and they kept them smooth. And Jesus said, you may look good and clean and spotless on the outside, but you don't have real life on the inside. You are filled with dead men's bones. You're not regenerated. You're just religious. And there is a world of difference between going to church and having Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior. You don't even know what life is until you get born again. I'll tell you another sign of religious people. Verse 31, they hate real preachers now they love hirelings they love puppets but son they hate a man of God Jesus told them said I've sent prophets unto you and you've stoned them and you killed them Jezebel had 480 prophets 480 preachers but there was one that she hated because he was a prophet of God and he told the truth you better watch this crowd that always talks about how much they love Jesus and love his word. But when you bring up the name of a real man of God, they start foaming at the mouth, their eyes get bloodshot, their hair stands up, and boy, they find all kind of fault. They want, oh yeah, I'm preaching now, ain't I? Well, I don't like him. He don't preach in love. I don't like his personality. I don't like the way he dresses. He yells too loud. You shouldn't sweat when you're preaching. He shouldn't run around. He throws things. He points people out. He's too bold for me. That is the manifestation of somebody that's religious but has never been born again. Here's what the Bible said. Great peace have they that love thy law, and there's nothing in that law that's going to offend you. If you've really been born again... If you've really been born again and I preach this Bible, something inside of you ought to be saying, Amen, Amen, Amen. Verse 27, they think they're good enough to go to heaven in Matthew 23. They think that keeping the law will get them to heaven when they die. Some of you think if the good outweighs the bad, you'll get to heaven. You're going to miss it by a long shot. Some of you think because you're a good person, you give stuff away, you help the needy because you help the sick. You may read a Bible once in a while or say a prayer or live clean or have the keys to the city, but that'll never get you to heaven when you die. Jesus said you must be born again. Verse 37, they refuse salvation. When God dealt with them, said, I'd gather you as chicks, they said, we don't want anything to do with you. Verse number four of this chapter is a sure sign that I see in Kingsport every week of my life. Religious people love to control their leadership. The Bible said in chapter 23 and verse 4, they put burdens on the shoulders of their leaders. The reason why they put burdens on their shoulders holds the implication of a yoke. When you put a yoke on an animal's shoulder, it's where you can turn it to the left and you can take a bridle and turn it to the right. See, religious people have to be in control of everything. And when you tell them the Holy Ghost and the Word of God is in control of a church and you preach this book, they'll hate your guts. They'll lie about you. They'll say stuff about you. They'll criticize you. They'll get on Facebook and Twitter, say all a bunch of nonsense, and here's the reason why. I'm not for sale. You're not putting a yoke around my neck. You're not putting a bridle in my mouth. You're not putting a saddle on my back. You're not buying me with a paycheck. You're not going to own me with a crowd. You're not going to stand up and defy this Bible. I'm not putting up with that nonsense. And that's why some of them pulled out of here because they found out they wasn't going to control me. And if you don't like it, you can leave with them because I'm telling you right now, I've got no buddies when I get in this pulpit. I'm going to preach this infallible word of God, and if it nails you, it'll nail you. That'll just have to be the way it is. We're not cutting corners for anybody. And religious people cannot take that kind of preaching. So they go down the road to Dr. Smell Fungus and Sister Underarm 
where they can lie, cheat, damn, steal, play the lottery, be social drinkers, have extramarital affairs, let their kids fornicate, snort a little crack, have a little meth on the side, and the pastor clap his hands and talk about a good devil and how everybody's going to heaven. Isn't it wonderful to be part of such a great thing? And they bat their eyes like a bullfrog in a hailstorm. And if you preach one message against sin in that liberal mess, it'd blow it all the way to Birmingham, Alabama. You can have that kind of church. I want a fire-breathing, God-honoring, hell-raising, Bible-preaching. I gotta have preaching! Their final embracing of religion over God's redemption will one day spin them into the realm of obscure darkness. Religion. Number three gets even closer to home, and to be honest, I'm fearful when I preach this point. I want to talk about the attitude of rebellion. Did you know God can put you in obscure darkness just because of a bad attitude? You find that in our text, Proverbs chapter 20 and verse number 20. For young people, this is a very stern warning from Almighty God. We are living in a generation that is harsh, unloving, self-centered, supercritical, controlling, and very manipulative. We've got to be careful with this generation of young people. Are you aware that right now while I'm preaching, there are less people in America percentage-wise going to church now than ever before in the history of our country? Are you aware of the fact that while I'm preaching right now, over 50% of the United States of America, over 50% is not sitting in a congregation anywhere at any time, not only today, but anytime soon? Why is it this generation coming on has lost a thirst and a desire to seek God? Why is it slipping away? Go to the average church. You look for people 35 and under, they're almost totally gone. It's like there's no interest in the things of God anymore. You go by the ball fields, they're packed. You go by the lakes, they're packed. You go by the golf courses, they're packed. You go to the NASCAR race, they're packed. You go to the football games, they're packed. And you go to churches and they're empty. Why is it? Could it, believe, could it be that this is that generation that God warned us about? You see, young people, you better be glad you're living under the dispensation of grace. Because if we were still under the dispensation of law, I'm not sure that we would have very, very many teenagers left in our church at all. Here's what happened in the Old Testament. If a teenager began to rebel against their parents, their parents were commended and commanded to chastise them. You know what that meant? It meant to beat their rear end. That's what it meant in the Bible. I know you don't hit your kid. I can tell by the way the heathen acts. I know you don't whip that kid. Give him to me for a week. I can change his attitude. I promise you. I can change him in one week forever. Somebody said to me, do you know if you whip a kid, it warps their mind? You know what I said back to them? Do you know if you don't whip them, they'll warp your mind? You ever thought about that? So if anybody's mind is going to get warped, it's going to be theirs. And God said in Deuteronomy chapter 21, if your child begins to be a rebel, spank them. I didn't say beat. I didn't say abuse. I didn't say smack. I didn't say pull their hair. I didn't say beat them with a water hose. I didn't, I didn't say be, mistreat them in any way. God gave an appropriate place to correct a child. And I don't want to get into detail of that. If you don't know, see me after service. I'll talk to you about it. There's a proper way to correct your child. But children have become so manipulated that now they know how to pit mom against the dad. So dad wants to bring the hammer down and mom says, I don't know if we need to do that or not. Or mom says, you know what, they're getting a smart mouth and we need to tighten up on them. And dad says, oh, it's just the phase they're going through. Now the kid knows that you're not on the same page. So the child begins to manipulate the parents. And all of a sudden, when something comes up where the child needs corrected, that child knows all I got to do is get mom and dad to argue against each other. They'll go in the bedroom and scream and slam the doors and, and uh, I can go my merry way and get by with what I want to get by with. And you might as well clap because you know I'm telling the truth. And so God said you take that child and you paddle them. You correct them. Now, if the child continues to rebel, this is what the Bible says. So don't look at me like that. In Deuteronomy 21, you took the child to the priest and told the priest, we have loved them, we've instructed them, we've prayed with them, we've corrected them, we have chastised them, yet they are still full of rebellion. The priest would take that teenager 
and take them to an open field. And the elders of Israel would pick up rocks and they would stone that, that rebel until they were dead. And here's why, Brother Charles, they stoned that teenager. Because Israel felt like if that child will not submit to a voice of authority that they can see, the parent, they will never submit to the voice of authority that they cannot see, which is God. And their life was taken from them, and they were killed. And all the young people would pass by the pool of blood and be reminded of the consequences of rebellion. There's something wrong with a child that disrespects their parents. There's something wrong with a child that will disrespect God. There's something about a child that develops hate and bitterness toward those that love them the most that almost puts them to a point where they're unreachable. Not long ago, a grown young lady said this about her parents. I don't have anything to do with my parents. I love them, but they have to earn my respect. Earn your respect, young lady? I hope you're listening today because I'd like to address your stupidity. When your mother went through the jaws of death and laid on a birthing table to bring your sorry hide into this world, I call that respect. When they wiped your dirty rear end and changed your diapers and taught you how to go to the bathroom the first three years of your life, they deserve respect. When they fed you when you couldn't feed yourself, they deserve respect. When they rocked your fever and washed your dirty body, they deserve respect. When they took time to teach you how to walk and talk and love and laugh, they deserve your respect. When you think about all the things your mother and father has done without so that you could have your clothes, your shoes, and your cars, I call that respect. Above the fact that they prayed for you, protected you, and have always been there for you. And now for you to be a little smart aleck, half-grown, nitwit punk and reject the fact that knowing your mom and dad is just a phone call away that would be more than willing to forgive you, embrace you, help you, and love you. And for you to turn that opportunity away, you have crossed a line of darkness. And no matter how much church you do, how much Bible you read, and how many prayers you're offering, you're not coming back to the light of the gospel. Show me one young person in 66 books of the Bible that disrespected their parents and ever got right with God. We are raising a generation of teenagers that make fun of their parents. They literally laugh at them. I'm living proof that I never laughed at my parents because I wouldn't be here today. You judge your parents. You judge your parents knowing you've never stood in their shoes. You've hindered them. You've left them hanging. Some of you have physically abused your parents, pushed them, spit on them, smacked them. You've disrespected them. You ignore them when they try to talk to you because you're on your phone with your Facebook and your buddies. You don't even have time to listen to a decent conversation with your mom and dad. You're sarcastic toward them. You backtalk them. You curse them behind your back. And the last man that did that in the Bible, God let him hang from a tree by his long hair, and Joab and his men threw three darts through his heart. And he bled to death and hung there like a deer. And his name was Absalom, and he died. So I want to say to all you young people, you being a rebel and going against your parents and running away and slipping out of the windows and fornicating and lying and all this other mess you're getting involved in, social drinking after a football game, smoking a joint, you're entering into a realm of darkness that one day you may not ever be able to get out of and God will pronounce that judgment on a teenager that disrespects and hates their mom and dad just as fast as he will a sodomite a lesbian a God denier and an atheist and make no mistake about it I'm closing with this somebody would say brother kid when you preach a message of such severity how can you be happy how can you be glad? The Bible said in Acts chapter 26 and verse number 18 that God sent Jesus to open their eyes 
and to turn them from darkness unto light. They were the, there was a day when all of us was lost, blinded by our sin and darkened by our depravity. But thank God in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4, the Bible said the light of the glorious gospel was shed abroad into that darkness, expelled that darkness, revealed to us the Son of God, and through faith and repentance we received him as our Savior. I was reading the other day about a caterpillar, and it was talking about how a caterpillar, really there's nothing to its life. It's a, it, I've, I've never heard anybody that believes in reincarnation saying, I want to come back as a caterpillar. You can't tell its head from its rear. You don't know if it's in forward or reverse. I mean, there's just nothing about it. You can't eat it. It's just, it's just furry, nasty-looking things. And if you squish them, they go everywhere. And they stink. Nobody raises caterpillars. Nobody wants caterpillars. But what they don't see is the potential inside that caterpillar. They're so busy looking at what it is, they don't see the potential of what it can be. So the caterpillar ignores all the criticism, climbs up on a tree, wastes his life, eats a couple of leaves within a lifetime, and crawls out on a limb, and from his tail, he begins to expel a liquid-type string. And that caterpillar will, will make a shell that we call a cocoon. And when he, really, it's a casket. He's making that cocoon himself because he knows he's getting ready to die. It's amazing. And he crawls in that cocoon, and then he spins a web to, in front of the door. And in that cocoon, in that casket, a wasted life, all alone, he dies. He just dies. But inside of him is life. Everybody thinks he's dead, but he's not dead. There's life inside. And while that cocoon is wet, Brother Corey, the life inside sees nothing. There's nothing but darkness. It's 100% darkness. But as the sun bakes that cocoon and pulls all the moisture out of it, that cocoon becomes crackly like a shell, and that life that is in that caterpillar all of a sudden out of darkness, because of the permeation of the sun, now it begins to see a little light in the darkness. <laughs> And the life in the caterpillar starts saying, I want out of this deadness. I want out of all this deadness. I'm tired of all this darkness. I'm tired of all this deadness. I'm tired of all. I'm tired of wasting my life. I'm tired of being a nobody. I'm tired of being a failure. I'm tired of being a loser. I know it's been dark, but I see a ray of light from somewhere, and he keeps fighting, and he keeps fighting. All of a sudden, from out of nowhere, Brother Randy, that cocoon cracks open. And that beautiful butterfly, the first thing he sees is the sun. And he starts flying toward that sun. And he came out of darkness. And he came out of deadness. And there he goes, taking his flight. <laughs> oh, yeah. Excuse me, Mr. Butterfly. Excuse me. I notice you're singing. Would you sing this way for just a moment? I saw the light, I saw the light, no more in darkness, no more in night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow in sight. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. There was a day when I was dead in my sin. There was a day I was dark in my sin. All of a sudden, the somebody brought the light of the gospel and told me about Jesus and I broke out of that bless his holy name I broke out of that deadness give the Lord a hand in the house of God today Woo! 